If I could ask the panelists then to join your seats down below and we move on briefly to the, the final short session before lunch. So now we come to the presentation from the Grand Challenges Student Day and I'd like to invite Professor Tony Hay, Vice President of Microsoft Research, to the stage to in introduce the Grand Challenges Student Day held at the Academy on Monday. Uh, once Professor Hay has taken the lectern, you, can, uh, you, uh, you will see a short uh, film. He'll make his presentation, but I'll leave it in his hands for, for the next ten minutes. Tony. Yes, I work for Microsoft Research after spending 25 years in a UK university and running a, a program for the RC UK called the, the eScience program, which in the US would be translated as cyber infrastructure. My job now is, is, is really great. I work for Microsoft Research doing research collaborations with great universities. I usually say in every continent around the world except Antarctica. So I see great universities in China, in Europe and, and in the US, and it's a great privilege. And so, really, our future is in the hands of the students, and that's why it's really appropriate that we celebrate what the students do. So, uh, we had a student day on Monday, and what was uh, the format of the meeting was that we had 60 top engineering students from universities uh, around the world, and we invited them to do an impossible task, all right? So, we had gave them six of the grand challenges and told them to come up with an innovative solution to at least part of those grand challenges. And of course, in a day uh, with only access to uh, a limited number of resources, it's impossible to come up with, with a, a solution and a business plan and everything else. But really, uh, I think we were all impressed by, by what they did. So the grand challenges uh, were the following. Uh, provide access to clean water, restore and improve urban infrastructure, advance health informatics, secure cyberspace, enhance virtual reality, and advance personalized learning. All interesting challenges, and uh, it was interesting to see uh, what challenges they chose because they were able to choose which ones they wanted to work on. For me, from IT, it was slightly disappointing that we had to combine secure cyberspace and enhanced virtuality, virtual reality into one because there were more people interested in the others, but that's an interesting comment in itself. Uh, but the, the day was structured uh, around uh, sort of roundabout of activities exploring all parts of the design process and they had to sort of figure out which bits that they were going to do and, and uh, what was their solution, were they going to involve some unknown research or whether they're going to take existing technologies. Really a, a great significant number of challenges they had to solve and then to, to work out how to present it. So um, on, on the solutions in the, in the access to clean water, we had uh, innovative hydroelectric power coupled with, a, with a, a water filter and making that available to, to urban, to, to villages around the world which actually have access to who need access to clean water. Uh, the buses, for example, or, or the underground in London, you see the times of the trains arriving. What if you could actually also have the loading, which, which carriages are, are full, which ones are not. You could choose where you stood on the platform. And this is just a part of an intelligent urban infrastructure. Uh, securing cyberspace and in virtual reality, that was really um, uh, trying to give you augmented reality, such as things like Google Glasses, where you could have a personal assistant could advise you in all sorts of things. So, for example, uh, what I increasingly need now when I see someone who I recognize, I can't quite remember where I last saw them or whatever. So it would tell me, oh, you met Jim Al-Khalili, uh, you talked at the uh, Institute of Physics, and he comes from Portsmouth, and you were talking about Portsmouth Southampton football, all right? So it could tell me these sort of things, and I could greet Jim is an old friend and say Portsmouth's, Portsmouth's in trouble, all right? Um, 
for example. Uh, and uh, advanced personalised learning, things like the gamification of education. How can we make uh, education more innovative, more, more exciting for people to engage? So those were some of the, 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 the sort of challenges. But the, the challenge that we decided to win was the team of angels, who uh, I'm grateful for my colleagues, were unanimous in thinking that the health informatics team had made an interesting start, and it builds on, on the presentation you heard today by Eric Brown on Watson, and so what I'd like to do is call upon the informatics team to come and win their prize, which is, the prize is to present to an audience of 400 people, and uh, <laughs> I wish them luck. So could I ask the team to come up? Okay. Well, students, professors, deans, entrepreneurs, engineers from the US, the UK, and China, we all come from different countries and different parts of the world, but one thing is a constant. The accessibility to preventative and primary care is a global grand challenge. So this really stems from three different things. One is the cost. We heard from Lord Darcy yesterday that about 19% of the US GDP is spent on healthcare. You guys must think we're crazy. 20% um, of people in the U.S. have no sort of health insurance. Obviously, low-income populations, also in developing countries, suffer from these challenges as well. Number two is time. So in the U.K. and in, in some public health systems, perhaps just going to the doctor isn't that big of a deal financially. But can you work it into your day? Do you have the time when you're on your way to work to stop by the clinic? Um, if you do, if you call your doctor, do they have the time with their busy schedules to fit you in in the near time? Number three, especially in developing countries, is geography. Do you live in a rural area? Can you actually make it to a diagnostic clinic to get checked out? So we need to do something to dramatically reduce these barriers to simple preventative and diagnostic care. So Telehealth Express has come up with an innovative solution by leveraging state-of-the-art medical analytic technology, such as Watson, which was just prevented earlier, and packaging that with an elegant process solution to revolutionize uh, preventative and primary care. Um, so what we heard earlier was um, a bioinformatic tool such as IBM's Watson. Um, but what we also need is a process innovation and something that would reduce the systematic inefficiencies in healthcare and help to streamline the process of diagnosis. So even in the developed world, despite having access to some of the best healthcare, three out of four people have difficulty in making an appointment and receiving after hours care for a non-emergency condition, and this is without visiting an emergency room. So, and the situation is much worse in a developing country. So we're just gonna present two examples of people who would face such a situation. So first we have Frank, um, he's an accountant in Seattle. He works 60 hours a week and to very tight deadlines. If he wakes up one morning with a cough, um, he won't have time. He won't have the luxury of taking a couple of hours off to go and make an appointment with his GP. He doesn't have the time to get, even if he does get an appointment on the same day, he may not have time to go and see his GP. On the other hand, um, Claudia, she lives in a developing country. She lives in Colombia. She works as a maid, well, juggling several jobs to look after her family of three small children. If one of her children gets sick, she'll have to maybe spend half a day waiting around to get an appointment. Can she afford to lose half a day's income and afford um, the doctor's services? So what we see here is in both developed and developing countries, some common problems are being faced. One is being able to see a doctor quickly, and two is being able to, see, being able to afford to see the doctor. So this is really a challenge to primary health care. Um, and at Telehealth Express, we think that this doesn't have to be the case. So if we take the example of a developed country, the model that we propose, so this is the model that we propose. So for example, if Frank wakes up and has a cough, um, he can enter his symptoms onto 
um, an online portal or use an app on her smartphone. Then we'll use a diagnostic tool such as um, Watson's, uh, IBM's Watson, which will um, use the symptoms which have been entered and output and maybe use some tests which Frank needs perform, for example, a throat swab. Then Frank will get a reference code, for example, similar to checking in online for a flight. He'll get a reference code which he can print out. Then off he goes to work. On the way back from work, if maybe he stops up at his local supermarket where there will be a telehealth express station with a nurse's aide who will take the sample that's required and send it off to the lab. And that's all that Frank will have to do. The lab will then send the results of the test back to Frank's GP, who can then email Frank with um, his prescription should he need any medication. So this process will remove the need for appointments and virtually eliminate waiting time. So I want to stress that this is for um, non-emergency conditions. So if Frank, the symptoms Frank enters onto the online portal indicate that it's an emergency condition, he'll be directed to visit the emergency room or visit his GP. So this is for a developed country, but what about a developing country? So as we said, we're talking about the latest in, in cognitive software to help streamline and break down the barriers and improve the efficiency of this preventative care process. So how do we bring that to developed countries? So as we heard a lot yesterday, uh, bandwidth is perhaps a big problem in developing countries, but SMS and, and text messaging, not so much. So um, obviously also in a lot of developing countries, there's big urban centers. Uh, the model we just showed before could be very applicable for the urban centers. But so let's focus on more of the rural communities. How would you be able to bridge this challenge? So our thinking is that with Telehealth Express, you could also have an SMS text-based system where essentially the individuals in the rural communities would be able to send a text message where numerically it might codify some sort of symptoms. So we could have an office in an urban center with a mobile Telehealth Express truck. And essentially, if someone is, is not feeling well, they can text in a code number two or five might be uh, nausea with diarrhea and essentially feed that into the Watson system at, at our offices in the urban center to figure out, okay, what is the urgency of their care to organize a triage system and then text us basically a, a location and a time where the health truck can pass by. So you wake up and send these text messages. We're starting our day with the mobile health unit and essentially we have this triage system of different patients in local communities that need different diagnostic tests. And you organize a strategy of where you need to send that mobile truck throughout the day. Um, they could be going to a lot of these cell phone charging stations, which are very popular in these small cities, uh, in the convenience of their day. So the whole focus is to how do we leverage the advancements in artificial intelligence and this Watson software, really break down the barriers of cost, of speed, and of geography to make sure that access to uh, primary and preventive health care is accessible all around the world. So we're Telehealth Express. We understand that this uh, concept needs to be catered to the idiosyncrasies of each country and each locality. So we're really looking forward to your feedback on how many of this approach could be customized for your countries and your locales. Um, you can contact us at telehealthexpress at gmail.com. And um, you know, we really think that we can uh, by leveraging the, the, this uh, analytical software and this very elegant process solution, we can begin to revolutionize um, this grand challenge. Thank you very much. So thanks very much. It was a really great experience to see the students. Uh, and uh, I'm slightly reminded of Bob Dylan's lyrics, the times they are changing. Your old road is rapidly aging. If you can't lend a hand, get out of the way. All right, so I think that's, the, that's for the older people in the audience. Uh, just continuing on, on the theme of, of students, uh, I talked to Dean Kamen. He, he's the inventor of Segway, the two-wheeled thing that you can ride on and balances inc incredibly cleverly. And he has a video here uh, which shows you the sort of enthusiasm of his student competition. So in this, just to conclude this, three minutes before you go to lunch, I'd like you to watch this video uh, from Dean Kamen. So can we roll the video? This is the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl of smarts, that is. It's a life-changing competition. It's kids having fun, 
competing, working together to dream up, design, and build robots. It's just an exhilarating feeling. It's like I'm using power tools. They're having the hardest fun they'll ever have. And they're becoming our next generation of engineers and innovators. First, come out. for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, my teachers were some of the greatest influences on my life by challenging and trusting me. These mentors got me to understand that I could do anything I put my mind to. First mentors are changing kids' lives every day. Professional engineers, teachers, parents, teaming up with young people not just to build robots, but to build confidence and self-respect. I'm around people that I can get along with, that we can talk computer lingo with. First was founded by one of our greatest inventors, Dean Kamen. Dean saw that kids mostly look up to sports heroes and movie stars. So we said, if we've got a culture now that's obsessed with sports and entertainment, Let's inspire these kids to be big thinkers the same way Shaquille O'Neal can inspire them to spend dozens of hours a week bouncing a ball. Our president agrees. Scientists and engineers ought to stand side by side with athletes and entertainers as role models. And here at the White House, we're going to lead by example. We're going to show young people how cool science can be. Go! 250,000 kids aged 6 to 18 compete at all different levels. In two first Lego leagues, the first tech challenge. And at the high school level, the first robotics competition. The only difference between this sport and all the others is every kid on our teams can turn pro. There's a job out there for every one of these kids. Robot! Students who take part in first are 50% more likely to go to college and twice as likely to major in science or engineering. I definitely know that I want to pursue engineering. Once they've tasted what the power of knowledge is, that it can be fun and rewarding, they won't go back. There's no doubt, first works. 10 or 15 or 20 years from today, some kid in those stands will have cured Alzheimer's or AIDS or cancer or built an engine that doesn't pollute Look at these kids. They're, they're the future. I feel like I can go and do anything I want to do because of this program. Someone took the time to guide and inspire me. It changed my life. Take some time. Go to usfirst.org. Thank you very much. All very inspiring.